welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, a place where you can keep informed of the latest business and tech trends by listening to stories of other people in your field and how they are overcoming challenges with emerging technologies. Join me in learning from the guests actionable tips and lessons learned to obtain greater clarity on how you or your business can leverage technology. Now, as a sports fan, I always find myself looking up random tech companies that keep appearing on my radar. For example, the Arctic Wolf logo has been seen adorning the the Oracle Red Bull F1 race car this year. And also the sponsor of the Wolves Football Club, which is very close to where I'm speaking to you from today. So when I googled them to find out more information, I learned that they're actually valued at more than $4 And yes, they provide security operation services, but they do more than just helping their partners with security issues. And I also read a recent report by them suggesting that cyber security professionals are often and lacking the confidence to prevent cyber attacks. So I invited them on the podcast today to learn more about the story behind the company and also a few insights from that survey. So buckle up. And hold on tight, because no matter where you are in the world, it's time for me to beam your ears all the way to the UK so you can join me and Ian McShane from Arctic Wolf. So a massive warm welcome to the show, Ian. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Hey Neil, yeah, my name's Ian McShane and yeah, disappointingly I'm not the actor Ian McShane. Like I said earlier, I'm... A lifetime of disappointment. I've actually been working in, in IT and security for, whoa, let me do the math, more than 20 years now. I started off in, in 2001, working basically as a general dog's body, as you do in a, in a small office, and kind of moved through things from there, like thinking about you know, a 24-7 call center that I worked in once, which was um, doing tech support for consumer email. And so if you're as old as me, you're, you know, you've been in IT for a while, you'll probably share my hatred of things like POP3, Outlook Express, oh God, and you know, plain text passwords, which was fun. Yeah, oh man, that takes me back. I'm getting IT flashbacks as we speak. And <laughs> if, if I was to take you back, can you remember where your passion for tech came from, that moment that put you on this path today? <laughs> probably, right? So, I mean... Video games for sure was a was a big thing. So you know, in the in the '90s, like Super Nintendo, Nintendo Mario. So I blame Mario for a lot of it. But it's interesting timing, right? Because this this past weekend, I think was the 30th anniversary of a movie called Sneakers with Robert yeah. Redford and, and Dan Aykroyd and a bunch of other folks. And that was that was really my probably my first introduction into I don't know I don't want to call it hacking per se, but you know that that side of things like. And, you know, being in the 90s before the internet was a big thing, you didn't really see too much. So, you know, I wasn't, it wasn't easy to get exposed to things like, um, you know, the hacking scene or the, the freaking scene or any of that kind of stuff. So sneakers was definitely a, a big thing. And then as I got through the 90s, really the bulletin board system um, and probably, you know, a bit of creative mischief with, with school computers as well probably helped a little bit there. Geo cities and the days of uh, 56k oh, ge- modems connected. blinking geo cities it's funny i was t- talking to someone last week and just remembering like going back to when i worked it was just after i worked in a call center i actually spent a, a bunch of my career as a practitioner yeah. and we were just talking about how slow i can't remember what it was we were we were talking about maybe it was just like a slow slow connection back to vnc to someone's you know to someone's home network and i was just re- i reminded them that you know back in the day i used to do use terminal services over 56k dial up to do like out of hours you know um patching and things like that and he's complaining uh, how slow things are yeah or were sorry well, I mean, it was that path that would lead you to Arctic Wolf. But I'm mm-hmm. curious, can you tell me the story behind the company and problems you set out to solve with technology? And also the name as well. It's an incredibly cool name. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a fun name for sure. So, I mean, it's, it, it's a great journey for me to get here because Arctic Wolf, and I'll explain what we do in a minute, but Arctic Wolf really align with some of the stuff that I'm really, really passionate about. Like, think about my, my history in security. I was a, a practitioner covering some things like you know the precursor to what we call office 365 today which was called hosted exchange and was really just exchange 2000 and exchange 2003 in a special mode and kind of covered messaging and sysadmin um, and endpoint security for a bunch of um, organizations like banks and and airframe logistics and isps before i managed to get into the the world of software vendors but my journey through software vendors has been interesting because it's linked to 
a lot of what we do today, are, you know, you recognize names like Symantec, uh, CrowdStrike, a company called Endgame, uh, Elastic. Mm. But probably my most well-known role was at a company called Gartner. So they're a research company that if you're in business, you're probably familiar with them in, in one way or another. You know, I spent a lot of time as the, one of the lead analysts for Endpoint Protection and spent a lot of time researching technology trends and modernization around, you know, how, do, how does the, the traditional AV market modernize and ultimately described where uh, the security industry is headed today with, with security operations. And, you know, that's, that's what we do at, um, at Arctic Wolf. I like to say we take the suck out of security operations. And what, what I mean by that is, you know, the industry doesn't have a problem with security tools, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we know that security is a big issue. Um, and we also know there are plenty of tests, there are plenty of examples and, and demonstrations that show that the available tools can function pretty well and that, you know, security can be implemented. I'll, I'll roll that back and say, I guess some of the tools are a little bit clowntastic, but for the most part, it's, it's an operational problem, right? It's a scale problem. And yeah, Arctic Wolf removed that frustration, the stuff that I used to hate, like the mundane, repetitive tasks that, you know, we can automate, we can take off our customers' hands so that the customer's IT team and security team can be more st strategy focused, right? We offer that layer of augmentation rather than replacement. And the best thing, like coming back to what I said earlier about like being led here, the best part is that we do it without removing any of the tools that you already have. Like there's no need to rip and replace anything because like when I was at Gartner, I would speak to, you know, I must have spoke to tens of thousands of organizations in my time and they would kind of, they wouldn't forget that there's a bunch of work involved in moving from one vendor to another vendor to another vendor or a product to another product. But it would be at the back of their mind. They're fixated on the marketing of, you know, oh, it's, this sounds like it's going to be great and it's going to protect us from everything today, tomorrow, in the future using, you know, AI and machine learning because that's the, the latest savior. But what they don't realize is it's going to take them two, maybe three years to be able to move from what they have today to the, you know, the future state, if you like. And, you know, this whole co-management stuff in a time of um, real shortage of human experience is really troubling. So that's what we're, we're here to do is we, we you know, deliver that security operations. We do it with the, the tools you already have and really just, you know, bring a, a level of scale that's almost impossible for many organizations to implement themselves. And the name, is there a story behind the name? I want to, <laughs> there, I want to hear there, about there, uh, in a meeting there, room and somebody <laughs> say it's like, like a cigar. So I think there, is, there, there is, there is a story and I, I'm a bit hesitant to share it for a couple of reasons. It's number one, I haven't heard it from the horse's mouth. And number two, it's probably not family friendly. Okay. But you know, there was a, another animal related alliterative name that they decided was a bit too risque before they came back to this one. It was formed by a couple of folks from, uh, in, basically in Canada. One of the, the chaps is based in, I think, um, America and the, the, the other founding lady was based in Canada. So, you know, it's a very cold area, a lot of snow. And I think they, you know, they picked Arctic Wolf in the end as a, a way to not only give an interesting brand but also you know it's it's about the way that we go to business like it's the power of the pack like we're here to, yeah. to support all of our customers so there's some, some nice um uh, synergy there too 100 percent. and one of the reasons i invited you on the podcast today was according to your recent survey uk cybersecurity professionals are currently overworked and lacking confidence to stop cyber attacks and that's before we even get to the fact that there's a <laughs> shocking a huge shortage of them out there as well <laughs> yeah. but can you tell me more about the survey and, and the insights you uncovered yes yeah, i mean surveys kind of ten a penny in, especially in security but what, what we wanted to do was not focus on it from a perspective of how terrible the industry is but more about how does it make the employees feel like right? especially if we're coming off this couple of years almost three years now of you know pandemic induced change mm. for almost everyone in, in a working capacity you know and with cybersecurity becoming even more important you know we see the the number of air quotes normal organizations um suffering from security incidents is, is grown and grown and grown and everyone's at risk so we really wanted to understand what it was like to be a practitioner rather than you know continually talking to decision makers and, and company owners so i think we got some really good information and, and, like, and like you point out you know that there's um a lot of a lot of worry about not being able to do everything and lacking confidence and, and just generally overworked and ultimately that's because you know it's expensive to do security despite what the other vendors will tell you there's no easy button right and there's no one size fits all and no magical ai is going to replace the need for humans the way i the way i kind of think about it or, or, or try to explain why it's so hard for organizations to hire enough people right now is not that there's not enough people looking for a job. But one part of it is just that it's expensive, right? You imagine every organization would love to have 
24-7 security operation, right? Someone monitoring things 24 hours a day. Well, that's going to take what well, a minimum of three people, right? To cover three eight-hour shifts. Then you have to factor in holidays and sickness. So that's maybe another what, two people. So you're talking five people in, in total to get the bare minimum. And then like, let's just say that the total package, the cost of, of hiring someone to an employer is, you know, let's say 70K per person, which is probably way low, right? Mm. Just pulling numbers out of the air. So you're talking about seven times five, 350 grand before you even get to the tools, the operating side of things, right? So there's a huge, huge, huge investment for organizations and, you know, smaller organizations dropping nearly half a, half a, a million dollars on yeah, yeah. the bare minimum is, you know, it's, it's not surprising what, you know, that you find organizations probably not doing enough. Number one, they don't know. And number two, if they do know, they're like, wow, shit, that's expensive. And as I said, there is a well-documented critical skill shortage in cybersecurity, <laughs> and a lot of people are promoting internally and training yeah. with internally. But your survey also revealed that 30% of cybersecurity workers claim that they don't know how to use their organization's security tools effectively. <laughs> a little bit worrying, but can you expand on your findings there? Yeah, I actually think that's pretty low, right? Yeah. Um, I think I think I said earlier, we've proven this isn't a tools problem, right? It's a scale problem. You know, we've, we take... We've got successful customers. We've got a lot of successful customers that use the tools they already have in place. So, you know, it's not a tools problem. It's a scale problem. And that means, you know, <laughs> for decades, really, this, this industry has made a fortune by selling tool after tool and add-on after add-on and buzzword after buzzword. And so when an organization has accumulated, you know, upwards of 30 security tools, that's a lot to learn and a lot to manage. And so you can understand that, you know, it's impossible to be an expert in all of those um, kind of capabilities, right? Yeah, man. And, and I also read in there another thing that stood out, because we were, if a company gets hit with the inevitable attack, and we uh-huh. all can, I think we can all agree it's going to be inevitable, that somebody's going to be the full guy in all this. And 56% <laughs> believe that they would be blamed by their management if their organization, organization <laughs> experienced a breach. I, I are you seeing a rise in blame culture like this? <laughs> I'm laughing because I think, again, I think that's low. I mean, I think in a yeah, lot of organizations that, you know, that don't have a dedicated security function that maybe don't have someone like a CISO or a CISO role where they understand how risk and governance and security works together as part of the, you know, the business rather than just a nice to have. It's not surprising that people think they're going to get blamed because if you have one person that understands security and again, air quotes for people that can't you know, see me making yeah. rapid air movements, air quotes, <laughs> like when security is broken, it's their fault. Someone's got to take the blame. And if there's only one security person, then it must be their fault. But, you know, you say blame culture. I think historically and frustratingly to me, it, it drives me absolutely mad. There's a <laughs> infosec in general is, is, is a blame culture, right? Think about yeah. it. End users are stupid, right? That's, yeah. that's the claim. End users click links, end users open emails, really dumb things. And it, you know, and again, I'm being sarcastic. It's not dumb things. Like links were yeah. designed to be clicked. Emails are meant to be open. Yet we, as an industry, lambast people for doing what they're supposed to do. So there's there's definitely a blame culture in infosec. Fortunately, I think that's starting to change now. I think as again, security is becoming more critical and more embedded into um, just business operations, and you get more um, leadership with. Uh, an awareness of security, that kind of blame culture is starting to drop down. People aren't thinking about end users being dumb as much. People don't tend to laugh so much about, you know, password books. In fact, like I'm going off on a bit of a tangent. This this is a great time of year to really figure out <laughs> who in your network you might not want to hire in security because we're coming up to uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Month in October, and you know some of the there's, there's an element of cybersecurity practitioners that, that think it's a waste of time. You know, it's not geared towards them. So when they start mocking all of the good work that, you know, CISA in the US and the NCSC in the UK start doing for educating the broader audience about cybersecurity and the risks of, of security, you can start to see, well, you know, maybe I don't want to hire those kind of people, the ones that are mocking password books and stuff that, are, you know, perfectly valid solutions for a lot of people's threat models. Anyway, I'm, and I'm curious for anybody listening out there if they have been shown the door and, and told the words you had one job <laughs> and the event never <laughs> breached. <laughs> I'd love to hear from them. But, but yeah, I mean, you live and breathe this space. Did, did, does anything in the report surprise you at all? I mean, honestly, the surprising thing for me was that that 50, 56%, um, because that means that 44% of people are like, nah, cool, I'm good. Like, if we get ransomware tomorrow, I'm good. Whereas I think, you know, if I was, certainly if I was in a sysadmin role or in an IT security role right now for 
you know, a, a mid-sized organization, or especially if I'm the only person doing security for any kind of organization, I would be like, yeah, 100%. If something happens, you know, I'm out. That's why I'm constantly looking for a new job. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious, with that in mind, what keeps you up at night? What what kind of things are you following and making, making uh, you nervous? I mean, honestly, it's the... It's the foundations of security, and this is something that's frustrated me for, for years, right? It, it kind of sucks that we haven't seen much progress in the, the foundations of security, things like asset management, things we hear about a lot, like vulnerability management. Like, it's really, really difficult to get a, a strong vulnerability management program in place and to, keep, and to stick with it. But unfortunately, the foundations are the foundations, and that's what makes your security posture stronger. Um, and, you know, I've kind of joked about that this industry, you know, selling more tools and more tools. They want to, they want to chase the, the, the marketing stuff, the shiny stuff that's going to make more dollars and sell more things, right? They don't want to, they want to turn people into Mr. Robot. They don't want to sell yeah. the stuff that hasn't been done for, for 20 years. And, you know, I'll give you an example of how, how little has changed in vulnerability management. It's like when I was a practitioner running a, a sysadmin team, we would, like any good sysadmin team, go for a beer at lunchtime on a Friday to, you know, discuss what we were doing at the weekend or what had happened during the week. And one one element that we started doing was we would all vote amongst the team. There was like six of us and we would vote for which guy or girl had said or done the stupidest thing that week. And that would be who would be on patch management duty for the next week. So patch management is like was like a punishment. It was yeah. like, um, you know, you screwed up so badly that you're going to be getting up in the middle of the night to, to patch all these servers next week. And it, that really hasn't changed. I think vulnerability management is still really difficult to, to implement. And it's kind of almost like a punishment for using technology. Right. So that's that's the kind of thing that keeps me up at night, because the foundations really, really do help build security and take things forward. And although there is a lot of doom and gloom around cybersecurity, <laughs> and we all we all scroll through those news feeds of every possible breach appearing each week, but what excites you or, or makes you hopeful about the mm-hmm. future and where we're heading now? Yeah, unless it's going to sound really self-serving, and I, I try I try really hard not to do this, but I genuinely believe it. Right, finding a technology company or a technology vendor that's going to help you scale. Right, that doesn't mean one that's going to throw humans at it like an MSSP. That doesn't mean one that's going to claim to replace humans with you know magical space dust and, and machine learning, mm. but someone that's got a technology platform that can help you scale and has a you know proven track record of securing organizations with the stuff they have, being able to take the tools they have and scale them. You know, coincidentally, just just like Arctic Wolf are able to do. Love that. And we started the podcast today talking about your origin story. What put you on this path? <laughs> Now we come full circle. I'm going to ask you to leave everyone listening with a gift of, of inspiration that you can leave everyone <laughs> with. And that can either be a song for our Spotify playlist or a book for our Amazon wish list. All I'm going to ask is a story behind that choice or a reason why. So yeah. what are you going to leave us with? I was, I was giving this some thought over the last couple of days. I've got a very eclectic music taste. And I was yeah. like, you know, I could drop a real curveball onto your Spotify playlist and see how that goes. But what well, I'm, before I'm you gonna... do that, a while ago, somebody had suggested pirate metal. So we had a, we had a pirate metal. <laughs> Oh yeah, I, I like pirate metal. I'm down with that. I'm down with that. <laughs> I was so instead of instead of throwing a random song on there, I thought I would recommend a book that I read um, earlier this year. And I actually read it. It was just after the the Christmas holidays, or towards the end of the Christmas holidays, and I had a day off, and I read the entire thing from start to finish in like 17 hours. And it's a, it's a book called "This Is How They Tell Me the World Ends: Colon The Cyber Weapons Arms Race," and it's by a, a lady called Nicole Pelroth. And it's it's. I actually think it should be required reading for people in cybersecurity because it's a really, really, really good investigative story into parts of cybercrime that honestly the average person has no idea exists, right? It gives a great example of why everyone is a target or everyone is a, is the transport to a target. It gives an example of why vulnerabilities are so critical and why information security professionals talk about vulnerability management. And it gives you an insight into the kind of the economy that goes around for initial access and um, zero days. It's, it's, it's a, such a wonderful book. I can't recommend it enough. And every time someone says, oh, I'm looking for a, a book about um, cybersecurity, where should I start? I've been recommending that one. It's, it's great. Well, I must admit, I've, 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 I can't say that I've read the book. I've listened to the book on order. Oh, there you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It, I listened just to it earlier good. this year. Yeah, oh, man, it's, it blew my mind and terrified me all it's, at the same it's, time. It's, it's excellent. And, you know, there was, there was some nice, nice stuff in there for me because some of the names I've worked with and some of the companies yeah. I've worked for before were in there as well. So it had a bit of a, a personal connection for me. But I, honestly, I thought it was a really, really well-documented uh, insight, just like I say, into, into things that, 
you never really hear about. Like you hear about ransomware and you hear about breaches, but you don't really hear about the, <laughs> it's a bit cliche, the seedy underbelly of cybersecurity yeah. industry, right? And some of the stuff with Snowden as well. It's just uh, uh-huh. absolutely brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, well, another thing before I let you go, I've got to mention as well, aren't you? Because I'm recording this today in Wolverhampton. Uh, you guys mm-hmm. are sponsor of Wolves Football Club? That's yeah. right. Yes, we are. You know, being Arctic Wolves, you know, it's, it seemed like the, the reasonable place to go and um, invest in a Premier League team. So, yeah, good times. Oh, amazing. And for anyone listening that would like to find out more information about Arctic Wolf, what the work you're doing, maybe check out that report. What's the best starting point for everything? Absolutely. Head to arcticwolf.com. Um, pretty simple. You can find me on Twitter. My name is Ian McShane, and I'm, I'm at Ian McShane, all one word. Uh, not to be confused with the actor, but I do have the same name. So, does that, From a cybersecurity point of view, does that protect you when people are trying to Google and clone your identity and things? <laughs> it, it means that for, a, for a, a very long time, I've been careful about what messages I read on social media because I get some pretty weird ones let me tell you that well more than anything just a big thank you for taking the time to share insights from that report and your incredibly cool story as well thanks again Ian. mate thanks so much for having me it's been great some worrying stats in there wasn't they such as the fact that uk organizations are being put in very precarious and unsecure positions with over a quarter of respondents stating that they don't actually feel knowledgeable enough as an individual to spot a cyber threat And we all hear about imposter syndrome, but in this particular situation, that's quite alarming, especially when combined with the fact that 30% of those workers claim they don't know how to use their organization's security tools effectively. And when you also add in that 56% believe they would be blamed if the organization experienced a breach, there is a lot of work to do in this field. And when we also throw into the mix the fact that there is a huge global cybersecurity skill shortage, what does this mean to you and your business? How are you overcoming these very same challenges? And this is where I want to hear from you. You've you've heard from me and you've heard from Ian today, but I want to hear your stories and how you're overcoming these challenges too. And there are many ways that you can contact me. Simply email me at techblogwriter at outlook.com. If you would like to slide into my DMs and send me an audio message on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok, you can find me at Neil C. Hughes. But a big thank you for listening as always. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Oh, 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 oh